Good afternoon, I'm Judy Simpson. Thanks for joining us for this 4th of July edition of Across the Fence. On this day, we celebrate phrases like, all men are created equal, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those words from the Declaration of Independence are more truthful today than they were in 1776. Today we recognize our founding fathers left many people out of those first conversations about equality, liberty, and freedom. It would take nearly 90 years and a civil war until the words, all men are created equal would even begin to come closer to the truth. General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Ulysses S. Grant on April 9, 1865. From that day on, the United States would begin to heal its wounds, a process that continues today. We join Vermont historian Howard Coffin and Across the Fence associate producer Keith Silva in Petersburg, Virginia for the beginning of the end of the Civil War. Very early in the Civil War, the Confederates built miles of earthworks to defend the city of Petersburg, 30 miles south of Richmond. Why Petersburg? It was vital to the Confederate capital of Richmond. Five railroads came into Petersburg and they fed supplies up to Richmond. If you're going to defend the Confederate capital, you have to defend Petersburg. This Confederate line, the original one, known as the Dimmock Line, was manned by only about 2,500 men in June of 1864. And after the unsuccessful fighting up at Cold Harbor, Ulysses Grant ordered a friend of his, General Baldy Smith, to take some 30,000 men and bust in down on Petersburg and capture the city. Smith got down here with his men all right, and there weren't many Confederate defenders. But when Smith saw these fortifications, they reminded him of the fortifications up at Cold Harbor, where so many thousands of Union soldiers had been killed and wounded in desperate attacks that never broke through. And so Smith got very cautious, attacked very tentatively, and by the time he was ready to throw a hammer blow, Lee had rushed soldiers down here and Petersburg could no longer be taken. Thus began a nine-month siege of Petersburg and the lines would grow and grow in length until they reached nearly 50 miles. Petersburg and Richmond survived on what came to them on the five railroads leading into Petersburg. One of those railroads was the Weldon Railroad that ran along where this road goes right now through this flat farm country south of Petersburg. From June 21st to 23rd, Grant tried to cut this road using mainly the Six Corps including the 1st Vermont Brigade. On the 23rd of June occurred the saddest day in Vermont's Civil War history, and it happened right here. Parts of the 11th Vermont and the 4th Vermont were sent ahead out on picket line and then put to work tearing up the railroad. But Confederates appeared in heavy numbers driving the Vermonters back, and they got in behind the Vermonters moving to the south and the Vermonters began to be cut off. There was bad command work that day on the part of the Vermonters and Colonel Samuel Pingree didn't do a very good job and the Vermonters were forced to surrender. 1,600 Union soldiers were captured here, among them 401 Vermonters and they all ended up in Andersonville. One of them, Luther Harris, from Lindenville, 
made sure that he slammed his treasured rifle on a tree so the Confederates couldn't use it. If I had been standing in this field during the siege of Petersburg in 1864, 1865, I would have been riddled with bullets instantly. I would have been killed. This was no man's land. Right there were the Union entrenchments. Right behind me along the tree line, the Confederate entrenchments. Trench warfare was born at Petersburg. This was our Meuse Argonne. This was our Flanders Field. Trench warfare would come to full horrible flower in World War I in France. But here it began, and for the men who had to fight it, it was awful. The long siege of Petersburg had barely begun when some Pennsylvania soldiers who had previously been coal miners came up with an idea. They looked at a place where the two lines were close together and they said, we can dig a mine all the way under the Confederate entrenchments. We can pack the end of it with gunpowder and blow a heck of a hole in those Confederate defenses. The proposal went all the way to Ulysses Grant and he liked it and they started digging right here. Here's the mine entrance, just 500 feet from the Confederate lines. It took a little over a month to finish the tunnel, pack it with powder, and then the morning of July 30th, the most famous moment of the Siege of Petersburg occurs. They touch off all that powder, the Union soldiers watching from way across the field waiting to make their attacks saw an astonishing sight. They heard a tremendous rumble and a roar and then fire came from the ground and then the earth rose a hundred feet and more. And they saw men rising on this cloud of dust and cannons and muskets a tremendous explosion and then they were ordered forward to cross a half a mile wide field and attack here at the crater and exploit a breakthrough in the Confederate lines. Black troops were given the honor of leading this assault and they bravely charged right down into the crater and getting down in here, they found they couldn't get out. The walls were muddy and slippery, and they did their best to get up to the rim of the crater and fight, but suddenly Confederate reinforcements were upon them, firing down into the crater, and a long battle went on here, but it was hopeless, and the crater became an abject failure. The last Vermont regiment to enlist was the 17th regiment, and they never did reach full strength. And they were assigned to Ambrose Burnside's 9th Corps. And it was the 9th Corps that made the attack on the crater. The 17th Vermont came rolling in here, coming up after, after the explosion, and by that time the tide had turned toward the Confederates. When the 17th regiment came in on the crater, this area was mostly back in Confederate possession, so the 17th Vermont, in desperation, took shelter in this sunken way just to the right of the crater. This fits their description perfectly, and they were under fire for hours until they were forced to withdraw with the rest of the Union attackers. Robert E. Lee was a general who loved the offensive, the attack. But for most of the siege of Petersburg, he had been bottled up in his entrenchments. But on March 25th, 1865, he decided to go at Ulysses Grant. And he ordered troops under John B. Gordon to attack at Fort Stedman. And it initially was successful in vicious, bloody, hand-to-hand -hand fighting. 
Gordon's men got into this fort and drove out or killed the defenders. And Lee had a victory, but it didn't last long because Grant rushed reinforcements here. The fort came under Union artillery fire, and by midday, 4,500 Confederates had become casualties, and Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia would never go on the offensive in the Civil War again. After the Fort Stedman battle on the 25th of March, there was a counterattack in this area. As a result, Lewis Addison Grant had a chance to ride up somewhat closer so we could get a better look at these Confederate works. And you see how high they are. Well, as we walk down along these works, you can see that they get lower and lower as they come down to a little swamp, which is where a brook flows through. Lewis Grant looked at this and he thought that that 60-foot gap was a serious weakness to the Confederate works where attack would likely succeed. In the foggy darkness of the night of April 1st and 2nd, 14,000 men of the Sixth Corps gathered far out in that direction, lying down, keeping quiet, ready to attack. At 10 o'clock at night, the artillery opened with a Vermont cannon firing. The barrage went on for two hours, more cannon than the Union fired at Gettysburg. The attack was readied, and the Union soldiers began to move forward. Many of them didn't want to go. One officer said he had to beat them with his sword to get them going. These men knew the war was almost over. This was not the time to die. After nine bloody months of trying, the Confederate defenses at Petersburg are finally broken by a farm boy from Wyndham, Vermont, Charles Gould. It is one of the Civil War's great moments. And today, a 424-acre battlefield park, Pamplin Park, preserves the site. 14,000 men coming through that field, and up in the front was Charles Gould and his company, and somebody hollered behind him, bear to the left. And he thought it meant for the whole formation to go that way, but as it turns out, Gould's company were the only men who started off in the direction toward that creek. And they crossed that creek and came up against the Confederate earthworks all by themselves. What to do? So Gould comes over the top and down into these trenches, and the North Carolinians light into him. He's sabered in the head. He's sabered in the face. He's bayoneted in the side. A comrade finally drags him back up over the lip. But now Union troops are pouring over these earthworks to the left and right of us, and Lee's line is broken, and Charles Gould was the first to break it. And Lee will now have no choice but to order Petersburg abandoned and then Richmond as well. Charles Gould is taken to a Union hospital and he will survive to live a rather long life back in Vermont. As for Lee's soldiers, they begin a long march to the west following the Appomattox River, headed they know not where, trying to link up with another Confederate army. Along that line of march is a little country town called Appomattox Courthouse. Robert E. Lee's once great army of Northern Virginia was down to 50,000 men when it left Petersburg. It moved west on country roads through this gentle Virginia countryside, hoping to meet up with Joseph Johnson's army coming up from North Carolina. 
The first battle of Lee's retreat west happened here at Namazine Church. There was a brisk fight here, the church miraculously undamaged, and then Lee kept moving to the west. A meeting took place here after the battle. William Wells was here, George Armstrong Custer commanding his division came up, and then Phil Sheridan himself was here commanding all the Union cavalry. They met briefly and Sheridan told them to ride hard. Let's cut off Lee's retreat. This is the village green in Amelia Courthouse, Virginia, a railroad town as you can hear. This was an important place in Lee's retreat plans. At the railroad tracks there were to be supply trains. His men were starving. But they had to wait here a day because the trains were late. And by the time the trains arrived and Lee fed his men, the Union infantry, not just the cavalry, was right on his heels. Lee's retreat continued until April 6, when part of his army was cut off just after it had crossed Little Sailor's Creek and they'd moved up onto that high ground that you can see. But they were cut off by Sheridan's cavalry and had to make a stand on that hill. Up into this area came the big six corps of the Army of the Potomac that included the Vermont Brigade. The Vermont Brigade went into line of battle around this house, but did not fight that day, although the second Vermont Regiment advanced a ways. The Vermonters who did fight that day, serving under General Truax, the 10th Vermont Regiment. And the 10th Vermont advanced behind us down into that valley and attacked up that far hill. The results were disastrous for Robert E. Lee. On they came under fire from the Confederates on the heights above. They waded this creek Little Sailor's Creek, and surged uphill. Later in the day, the 2nd Vermont Regiment would fire a few shots, exchanging fire with pickets further down the creek. But this was the last infantry action of the Civil War for the Vermonters. The great history of Vermont infantry in the Civil War that included the fighting at Gettysburg and Lee's Mill the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cedar Creek, Winchester, and of course Petersburg came to an end here. The Romaners didn't know it that day, April 6, but their fighting as foot soldiers was at an end. The Confederate troops arranged on this high ground never had a chance. Artillery fire rained in from the area of the Hillsman House, line on line on line of Yankee soldiers advanced up this high ground. Cavalry, Union cavalry came in from the east and soon the Confederates were surrounded and surrendered in droves. 8,000 Confederate soldiers laid down their arms up here above Little Sailor's Creek. Among them, the famous Confederate General Richard Ewell, Baldy Ewell. Some said he was in tears, seated on the ground when he gave up. His Civil War was over. From the high ground in this area, Robert E. Lee got a distant view of the fighting at Little Sailor's Creek. He turned to an aide and said, my God, is my army dissolving? A series of messages was about to be exchanged between Lee and Grant concerning the surrendering of the Army of Northern Virginia. The morning of April 9th, John B. Gordon received permission from Robert E. Lee to make one try 
at breaking through the Union cavalry, which was blocking the route west. Right in this area where this fence is, Gordon's men moved forward against a line of Union cavalry up along that tree line. In that line, the 1st Vermont Cavalry under William Wells of Waterbury. Firing began, and then the cavalry began to ride off to the right. Their moving revealed what was behind them. Ranks of thousands on thousands of blue-clad soldiers of the Army of the James. Gordon saw that, and it was too much, and he sent word back to Lee we cannot break through. But those cavalrymen were under the command of one of the fightingest generals ever, George Armstrong Custer, and he ordered an attack. When suddenly a blue-clad officer shouted orders to lower your rifles, you'll never have to use them again in this war. The charge was stopped, the fighting ended. A couple of miles short of Appomattox Courthouse, Lee's ride to the west ended. He found out that the way was blocked up ahead, and so he pitched his headquarters tent right here. Spent a rather quiet night of April 8th and 9th. In the morning, General Edward Porter Alexander came to him with a suggestion that maybe he should order his men to take to the hills and wage guerrilla warfare. No, said Lee, that would ruin the country. And he certainly was right. It was not long after noon that word came that he should ride up into the village to meet General Grant to discuss surrender. Lee rode up on his big war horse traveler coming from this direction, Grant coming in on Cincinnati from this direction, riding into the courtyard and climbing the stairs into the house to meet in the parlor. April 9th, 1865, the home of Wilmer McLean at Appomattox Courthouse. McLean, of course, had moved from Manassas after the first battle of Bull Run, down here to Southern Virginia to get away from the war. And suddenly it's the centerpiece of the war, his home. General Lee was waiting in his best dress uniform when Ulysses Grant arrived. There was a time of informal chatter as Grant well remembered Lee from the Mexican War. Lee may not have remembered him so well. It was Lee who finally called attention to the matter at hand, which was the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. About an hour and a half of talk and writing. At the end, Lee asked for an addition to the terms that the men be able to take their horses with them, his men, for the spring planting, and Grant agreed. Grant reflected on the day, and he remembered that on looking at Lee, he was unable to determine in any way what seemed to be on Lee's mind. What was he thinking? He himself, Grant, said that he felt no jubilation uh, at the triumph over a foe that had fought so long and so well, but he added, even though that cause for which they fought was one of the worst for which people ever fought. This meandering farmland stream, believe it or not, is the Appomattox River, which is about a half a mile wide at Petersburg. Lee's retreat had roughly followed the course of this river uh, his chances dwindling as the stream as he came a hundred and more miles 
to the west. It was along this river and in these surrounding fields that the Army of Northern Virginia made its last encampment and stayed here three days after the surrender. Why? Because on the 12th of April they were to march up into the village and surrender their arms to the Union Army led then by Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, an honor given to him for his mighty war record. Robert E. Lee left right after the surrender. He couldn't face seeing the arms laid down. On April 12th, 25,000 Confederate soldiers marched up this road, the Richmond Lynchburg Stage Road, up to the village to surrender their arms to the Union. On each side of the road were thousands of Union soldiers under the command of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Chamberlain wrote later, the dusky swarms forge forward into gray columns of march. On they come with the old swinging route step and swaying battle flags. On our part, not a sound of trumpet nor roll of drums, but an awed stillness, rather, and breath holding as if it were the passing of the dead. History tells us that the Civil War went on for several weeks after Appomattox, but for all intents and purposes, it ended right here. Additional funding for Mr. Coffin's work for this program was provided by Cabot Cooperative. Thank you.